This panel, looking at uh, developing William Gibson's Neuromancer as a game and a film, is also the first public introduction of a new TIFF program, TIFF Nexus, which is designed to uh, explore and enhance the intersections between film, gaming, and digital media. Uh, the Nexus series includes four one-day conferences built around specific themes, as well as four creative jams that bring, uh, bring together diverse creators from different sectors to collaborate and develop prototypes for games, peripheral interfaces, and other digital applications. Uh, the first Nexus conference takes place on October 28th, and you'll be hearing more about that in the coming week. Or you can check out our website, tiff.net slash nexus, which just uh, launched earlier today. Uh, TIFF Nexus is presented by the Ontario Media Development Corporation, and we thank them for their support. So the subject of this panel, uh, adapting a seminal cyberpunk novel, not only for film, but to engage audiences on various digital platforms in this transmedia, multi-platform universe that we live in, uh, really is the perfect way to kick off TIFF Nexus. And I'm thrilled to have uh, these great guests with us today. Um, to introduce them, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today. Mark Asquith is the producer of Special Projects at Space. And he's a producer, writer, and interviewer for Space Canada's national science fiction television channel, of which he is one of the founders. Uh, graduating from the University of Toronto with a degree in English, he moved on to manage one of the premier North American comic book stores, Toronto's beloved Silver Snail. <laughs> yeah. There, uh, he learned to soak up the atmosphere of comics and science fiction, meeting many legendary authors in the process. Uh, leaving the Silver Snail, he began writing a graphic novel called The Prisoner, shortly before becoming the comic book consultant on Canadian documentarian Ron Mann's comic book Confidential, which was released in 1988. The documentary, which was an overview of the comic book medium in the USA, inspired Asquith to elaborate on the medium, leading to his documentary news program, uh, documentary news magazine program, Prisoners of Gravity, which ran on TVO from 1998 to 94. The program explored science and speculative fiction and its relation to various social issues. Apropos that he's moderating this panel. Over to you, Mark. Well, I'm not going to do all that heavy lifting. I, I think I'll get everybody to introduce themselves. Uh, so uh, first of all, Vincenzo, would you introduce yourself, please? Live via Skype. <laughs> From direct neural feed. Um, I'm Vincenzo Natali, and I'm the writer-director of the Neuromancer adaptation, film adaptation. An interesting qualifier. Who's, who's sitting next to you or sitting next to the screen? Uh, I'm Trevor Fancott, and uh, yeah, we were working with uh, Vincenzo and uh, Jay Prodi Pictures on the uh, the game adaptation of Neuromancer. I'm Francesca Cinelli, and I work at Telefilm Canada, and I'll have two different hats on. Telefilm is involved. I'm off on on the feature film side, and then I'll also have my Canada Media Fund hat on because we get to work with Trevor on the game side. I'm Jay Firestone, and this is my third attempt at getting this movie made over the last 12 years. <laughs> uh, perfect. I'd like, first of all, the, the source material is William Gibson's amazing Neuromancer. Uh, I discovered the work in Omni magazine, first the short stories, and uh, when the book came out, I bought it at BACA, and I read it in about two days. Um, it was extraordinary, and it took over science fiction. It, was, it won the triple crown of science fiction awards. Uh, but for you, um, Mr. Director down there on the screen, uh, Vincenzo, uh, how did you discover the novel and what kind of impact did it have on you when you first read it? Um, well, you know, I think I was late to the table because I probably read it around 1988, maybe when I was 19. <clears throat> and, uh, and there really hadn't been anything like it. Um, even though the book had been, I believe, had been published in 1984, so it had been around for a little while, but, but popular culture absolutely had not caught up to it. And when I read it, it was definitely mind-blowing. I'm sure it falls into the same category as Dune or Martian Chronicles or Rendezvous with Rama, like one of the great works of science fiction. So, um, so it's, in my mind, it was always like a pillar of, of great speculative fiction and, um, Never in my wildest dreams did I think I would actually be working on it. <clears throat> it was a very intimidating process trying to adapt the book. And Trevor, how did you come to the book? Uh, I was probably one of the early adopters, probably maybe 85, or like fairly shortly when it came out. I was, a, I was the, the high school um, uh, AV robotics uh, nerd, so it really was uh, one of those things that was <laughs> required reading. Um, 
I think it, it had a profound effect on, on me, as with all the sort of the, uh, the other popular science literature that was out there. But this one was a lot more personal because what it was talking about um, you, you know, were, were these mind-blowing ideas like cyberspace that, I, that later would become reality. So I think it really shaped a lot of my desire to um, experiment with computers, computers as communications devices as opposed to just computational devices. Um, and, uh, and, and really, from, from an interactive perspective, there couldn't be a better uh, example of something that we now have technology to ex explore, like, I mean, a cyber deck. Um, and if you haven't read Neuromancer, release really shouldn't be in this room. But if you, if you <laughs> but a cyber deck, <laughs> well, hopefully a script, right? But um, the idea of a, of a hacking deck uh, and an iPad are not so dissimilar. And the idea that we can be connected at all times and jacked into things at all times is something that was completely alien in the '80s. I mean, this is the you know Sonny and Crockett with the big uh, cell phones and their car and stuff. But this is anyway, it's exciting stuff. Uh, I'm in the middle of reading it right now. I, I admit that uh, uh, I grew up with a very geeky brother, and I couldn't be seen to be reading anything he was reading, though I was a closet sci-fi viewer, so I'm much better at the kind of comic side. Uh, I have read the script. I'm enjoying the novel as we speak, so I might have to leave the panel halfway through because I'm halfway through the book. <laughs> Uh, my origins with it aren't that romantic, really, and not that artistic, to be honest. I put together Johnny Mnemonic when I was at Alliance, did all the business side, made sure we made a lot of money on it and all those kind of things, but never showed up on set. So afterwards, when that was done and I left, I thought I'd go after Neuromancer because, and actually produce it this time, not just put the money together. Uh, I developed it for a little while, lost it when I sold the company, got it back again, then lost it again, and then <laughs> two years ago, bought it back again, the third time. And uh, when I took it back, I went to Vincenzo, and now, for the first time in 12 or 13, oh, more than 12 years, probably, it feels real. Well, one of the difficulties of Neuromancer is it's incredibly uh, difficult to adapt. Um, the opening line, the sky above the port was like television tuned to a dead channel. Now that's impossible now because televisions don't look like that when they're dead. There's a blue sky. So that line reads incredibly different. What for you is the biggest challenge of adapting at Vincenzo? Um, yeah, well, actually, having said that it was very intimidating, it adapted rather easily. And I think for me, and in, in part that's due to the work of the screenwriters who had worked on it before me, before me including William Gibson, because um, it's a very dense novel, and I think there are any number of movies that could be made, or perhaps miniseries that could be made from this book. Uh, but fortunately, by the time I got it, there had been a lot of mining that had been done prior to my ar arrival. And, and so I could see from those scripts, frankly, what didn't work as much as what would work in a movie. And so I, I had uh, a lot of the, the heavy lifting done for me. Ultimately, I went back to the book itself, and, and in rereading the book many years after having read it originally, I was actually surprised by how cinematic its structure is, because it's fundamentally, it's a heist story. There's a lot of old movie influences in the book. I think William Gibson would be the first to admit you know, that there's some big sleep in there. There's a lot of noir-type stuff going on. <clears throat> so, so it's inherently cinematic, and it's really just, it was about picking and pruning it and in, in finding what worked within the context of a movie and what wouldn't. Um, that's just from a narrative standpoint. From the technological, uh, speculative um, fiction standpoint, the book holds up surprisingly well. I mean, what you said, Mark, about the first line is absolutely correct. And um, in fact, one of the earlier drafts of the script, not one that I wrote, someone else wrote, had that line in the, in, the, in the action notes, and, and I took it out because, as you pointed out, it's, it's really um, archaic, it's irrelevant now. But, but the underlying concepts that are in the book and, and truly what make it so prescient and relevant um, have stood the test of time. In fact, you know, it's still a little bit ahead of the curve. And, and my argument has always been um, that now is the time to make Neuromancer because I believe certainly for a cinema audience, had you made this film in 1984, it would have been incomprehensible. Simply because there's no way, and without ex an extraordinary amount of expositional dialogue 
a film audience would have been able to understand some of those basic concepts that are in the book, which now are actually a part of our daily lives. So they don't require explanation. And, and really, um, but the book's still far enough ahead of the curve, ahead of where we are right now, that it, it works as a piece of science fiction and as, and as a signpost, I think, for what um, is coming down the pike. So, um, so, you know, for me, it was the things that I had to change from the book were very much um, details. And I actually tried to stay very, and was able, thankfully, to stay very true to the novel. Um, in fact, I, I also had the good fortune to have William Gibson be very involved in, in my rewriting process, and he would comment on things and so on. And, and invariably, he never commented on the big things that I, I did to the book. It was always in, in the details. And he's, he, more than anybody, is cognizant of how technology is evolving and how it, how it did diverge from his book. It, he always points out to the fact that the one thing he truly didn't foresee were cell phones. Um, and there's a very famous scene in the book where Case walks past a, a line of uh, phone booths and they're all ringing and the, the sound, the combined sound of these rings makes, makes up his name. Um, and uh, so, you know, we just turned it to, into a bunch of cell phones doing the same thing. But, but, <clears throat> but it really, the changes I made were very cosmetic like that. And the, the underlying structure, and then most importantly, the characters um, really have stood the test of time. I mean, I think the book... If it were just like a great piece of um, futurism, I think it would people would have forgotten about it. But it's actually a great story, and it deals with very, really timeless, um, almost mythical themes. And and so I think it's it's very relevant now. <clears throat> and um, and so yeah, it was it wasn't so bad, you know? It really, it really. Now we haven't made the movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I want. I want to put it into context in a way, too. I, I'm holding in my hand an early failure to adapt Neuromancer. This is William Gibson's Neuromancer done by Marvel Comics in the mid-'80s, and I think it sold about six copies. And uh, it, it didn't work, and it didn't work because they were uh, too literal and too many of the ideas um, didn't work or, and translate. You know, you've had this property for over a decade. What was your sort of brief to Vincenzo? What did you want him to do? in adapting the material? Well, uh, over the years I've learned a few things because I've adapted a number of games and comic books uh, and gone the other way. I have a series now, Lost Girl, we're doing a game and a comic book going the other way. I have a series 13 based on a graphic novel and game from France. And I'd done this years and years ago and I learned that you don't have to stay true to all the details of any of these properties. If you do, you're in big trouble. A lot of the comic books and graphic novels that get adapted into movies, if they are really literal and they really try to what they say, uh, give the fans of the book what they want, they alienate everybody else. Because if you don't know the book, if you haven't read it, you're not gonna enjoy the movie. Without criticizing The Watchmen, I think a lot of people had criticisms of The Watchmen, that it was too close to the book, and people who didn't know The Watchmen didn't understand the film. So the only thing I can say is I gave Vincenzo freedom you know, to do what he wanted, and he worked well with Gibson. I mean, they were very much in sync. So I, because I do need, no matter what, the author of the book, to say I like this movie, because if he goes out and says, don't watch it, it's no, it's, I don't agree with it, we're dead. So they worked really well together. They, I, you, I think Vincenzo will say this, he connected very well with Gibson. So, It was part of that because you're a very visual guy. I mean, you've done storyboards, you're very interested in it. Was part of your simpatico with Gibson because you understood that it was noir? Uh, yeah, I think that's an aspect of it. It's a very intuitive thing, of course. And um, I mean, to me, I completely agree with everything that Jay is saying. And I think a, a literal translation of the Neuromancer book would be a disastrous movie. It would probably be impossible because you could never condense it into a single film. Um, so I, I wasn't literal but I, in my adaptation, but I very much wanted to stay true to the um, tone of it and, and the spirit of it. And, and that's where I, thought, where I felt personally very lucky to have William Gibson present in the process because, you know, of course, he would be the ultimate um, arbiter of what works and what doesn't. And, and I knew from reading one of his scripts, which was extremely unfaithful to his own book, that um, he would be open to making changes. So he, yeah, it's, it, it was very fruitful collaboration that way. And, um, and I'm totally sorry, I lost track of what your question was, but you were wondering about it visually? 
Yeah, well, you, you, you have a very uh, strong visual style from Cube and other movies, and you've done storyboards for a number of things, including Ginger Snap. So did you have kind of a visual take on Neuromancer? Oh, and you, well, uh, uh, yeah, we can get into Trevor later, too. Oh. Yeah, well, I Sorry. think it's, an, you know what, it's an ongoing process because um, the book is very visual. The book is very te textural. Um, it's almost po it poetic, really, in the way it's written. So it gives you a feeling, and, and my job as a director is to translate that feeling into art direction and set design and an overall aesthetic approach. Um, I, from the outset, my sense was that the, because the real world had caught up in many ways to what, what is in the book, that we should take a very realistic approach. And so my very, my very Hollywood way of describing the movie is it's like, uh, a science fiction French connection. Um, you know, one of one of the obstacles in in the selling of this movie to the industry at large is that everyone says, "Oh well, the Matrix did it already," because the Matrix, the very word "the Matrix" is taken <laughs> from Neuromancer. They 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 stole that word. I can't use it in in our movie. Um, and and a number of other there are a number of other similarities, but but I. First of all, I like that movie. And second of all, I feel like it's a completely different film than what Neuromancer would be because The Matrix is very much... Oh, I'm sorry. We were about to say something? Um, the, the Matrix is very much a comic book film. It, it exists in a comic book kind of universe, whereas one, one of the things that's so extraordinary about the book is it, it doesn't feel like a book that was written about the future. It feels like a book that was written from the future, in the future. And, and so it has an almost documentary, as poetic as, poetic as it is, it has a very um, documentary-like, almost realistic take on, on what that future world would be. So, so I felt that that was kind of my, my window into that world. And, uh, um, but, but in terms of the actual design and making that world real and making, making it for, you know, what our budget will ultimately be, which is not a $200 million budget, I don't think. Um, <laughs> uh, I, oh, no, no. I've actually, I've, I've sort of used that as, as, my, as my sort of central visual theme, but, but it's a process figuring out the specifics of, of how to render that. Well, speaking of rendering, Trevor, you're bringing the game design to this, but also I hear that your game design is, is having uh, kind of a, a feedback loop with Vincenzo. Explain that to us. Um, yeah, well, I think that from an interactive perspective, um, the, the way we're approaching Neuromancer is a little different because uh, games, I believe, um, are about uh, worlds and universes, whereas uh, you know, film and other traditional media are about sort of stories, and they have different kinds of arcs, and they are perhaps character-driven. And some, there's some games that can, can do that, but Tetris, there's no arc. It's a good game, but there's no arc to it. Um, uh, Angry Birds, I don't know, but but anyway, they so but but they are about universes and what's possible in this universe. So one of the things that was really interesting, and I think really helpful, was working with Vincenzo from the get go to kind of uh, take from him like what what does this what is this adaptation like? What are the rules of this universe? Is it the year twenty six hundred? Well, no, it's not. It's more it's more like twenty thirty than it is twenty six hundred. It's a distinction from the Matrix. Uh, what? Are people like there? Like, can you augment? You know, can you get artificial limbs? Are, are you know, are there submachine guns or lasers? Like, what's what are the what are the rules of this? And from an interactive perspective, then you let the player um, uh, free in this environment to experience it in a, in a way that's not passive, not just watching it. So, it was really important for us to work with Vincenzo to understand what the world you know looked like. What are the things in the world? What are like the minutia almost of this of this world? The, the point of cell phones versus. Um, um, you know, phone banks is, is a really important one. Things like, um, uh, you know, what do these environments look like? Is it more Blade Runner-y or is it more, you know, like we, we know it's probably not 2001 and sort of sanitized and stuff. So it's, um, you know, is it near future with garbage on the streets? Those kinds of things are going to be really important to a game because if you look at very successful, uh, I'm going to call them not movie games, but things like Knights of the Old Republic, it's not about playing Han Solo. 
Han Solo's a great car character, but you, it will always be antithetical playing that character. But it's letting the player loose in the world of Star Wars that is awesome, and that's what gets player engagement, and that's what really sort of drives that experience. And so, but you need to be faithful to the Star Wars universe for that to be uh, effective. So really working with Vincenzo um, very early on in describing pieces of this world, taking from the book and you know, taking from these things was, was extremely helpful. And hopefully it was helpful both ways around, but it certainly was for us in understanding what the, uh, what the universe contain, contains and what the player possibilities are. Well, maybe this is a question for you, Jay. Why did, you, why did this all happen early? Because normally game designers don't get involved until much later in the process. Uh, like it, not to pitch another show, it started on Lost Girl because uh, I wanted to go the other direction on Lost Girl from a, a series to a graphic novel to a game. And we have an app and a game coming out. And I started working with Trevor on that. And then Trevor actually pitched me another project. What's it called now? The Chinese guys? <laughs> green the, the, green the, Jade uh, or something? All right. Century Jade, yeah. yeah. So it was a very funny thing. Uh, Trevor sat down with me on this project called Century Jade that he wants to develop as a game. And I said to him, oh, no, can't do this, because there's no character, there's no story, there's no blah, 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 blah. And he said, yeah, but this great environment for a game, and we got level one, two, three, four, five. And I said, okay, but we can incorporate that into the quest of the characters, and we'll put a romantic interest. And we started talking about how we combine his game into a movie, and then all of a sudden, I think we just said, wait a minute, let's do this on Nermit, because uh, we can start early. Uh, and it's actually been a big benefit to me, because I can tell you right now the email from Universal that I got after they read the script and saw the visuals that uh, Vincenzo and Trevor got for me is, wow, I love the presentation that came with the script. Nobody ever does this. So I have, I have the world in a, what do I have, 10 or 12 page booklet that goes with the script. And so everybody can see that this is not the Matrix, which has been, that is the big obstacle this film ever getting made is that people think it's the Matrix. So all these visuals I got from those guys really shows it's not the Matrix. And that's been a big asset for me. Uh, it's not an irony, but it is interesting to point out that The Matrix was only sold because of all the amazing drawings that were done by Jeff Darrow and Chris Sprouse, and that sold the script, because people couldn't see that script or understand that script. So there's this weird kind of feedback loop. Then how did you, as you know, part of the outside funder person, come involved in so this? So in terms of the, the game, uh, Bedlam applied to the Canada Media Fund experimental stream. It's a competitive uh, environment, and our team saw in it a couple of things. One, they proposed quite unique and innovative technology that uh, we really think will uh, grab the, the, the players on multiple levels. And the other side was it's William Gibson. I mean, that was one of the big things. We had, you know, three different analysts look at it, and that was a big part of it. You know, uh, we we knew that uh, a game, I think it was Atari came out with a game, was it? Was Electronic it? Arts. It Electric was about the same time as that was the it? graphic novel with just was as it? much success. That's I had think I have one of those five copies of the game <laughs> that were sold. So it definitely had been tried, but... Uh, for sure, you know, Canadian, Epic, Cyberpunk, all those things played into it, but the experimental stream is an innovative fund. And, you know, I would say the one criticism that I often have to defend is, you know, kind of the console game world hasn't fared so well. Uh, and in this circumstance, it, it really proved that if, if you're using the technology in an innovative way, and in the way that they're setting up this gameplay, it really is new. And if it can kind of excite, because my team are all you know, game players, and it excited them, and that for me means that this is something we should invest in. You know, and in terms of the telefilm uh, side, uh, they're getting packaging money, and it is a little of what Vincenzo said. There, this has a heist feel to it, and the pulling together of, you know, a, a team which is, uh, I think, very common, and it will go beyond just the sci-fi people are, that are out there. The, you know, I think that there are a lot of um, great themes that the, the script that I read really pulled out of the novel that I didn't necessarily see in that novel, and that's what, for me, excited me. I, one day you'll get to see it on the screen, but that's the themes that went on that really, <laughs> that really compelled you to want to see the end, to see these characters. And you know, in terms of, as I was reading the book, I, I think in terms of the game, you, you have the cerebral side you know, and, and the problem solving and the, the technology problem solving and how is he gonna do it? And then you have these 
awesome action scenes. And I love the femme fatale, you know, as, as someone who's often looking for women in these roles, in these comic books, that's why I love Lost Girl. I, I'm compelled to look at it that's, at that. So it had for me all the elements, you know, clearly I've become a late fan, but it's, it often happens. So now I will probably have to go home and crash read this book, won't I? <laughs> and, and what for you are gonna be the benchmarks? I mean, what are you sort of looking to the team to develop and give you? I mean, what gave you uh, confidence that this was gonna work? Well, in terms of the, the film, I, I look out to my, my feature film friends in the audience, but one, we're waiting for Jay to finish finding the 60 million that uh, he needs. We say 100 million. 100. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you can raise 100 million, well, I'm sure we'll still That's support what we you. Say. That's what we're going to say. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think they're well on their way. They, they, you know, it has been a long journey for, for Jay, and he and Vincenzo really presented a, a strong document. The visuals really also compelled us as well because it's well thought out. And in terms of uh, this side, we, you know, we're in it at a development stage, so it's really kind of seeing, you know, how far along they're going to get, and they have to prove to us that they're going to be able to actually develop the technology. That they have to kind of put their money where their mouth is, and they have to back up all the, you know, as as all of you, I'm sure, have done. You put lovely things that you think might happen, pie in the sky stuff, and we expect you to to actually show us how you're going to realize that. And at the end, we're going to want to see something. Trevor. Well, and yeah, and a, and, a, and a shout out on that on that uh, frontier, and we'll leave what the actual super mind blowing tech. We're inventing cyberspace, by the way. Just I'll let that out. No big deal. No big deal. But but really, for for us, um, we we realized that we needed as we did the technological investigation of what is possible and what's you know kind of beyond our can. We realized that we did need um, significant amount of help. And in fact, our partners on this, um, and actually now our real partners we, we've merged are a group called Bitheads in Ottawa who have outstanding uh, technological pedigree that we know we need to actually bring this technological feat to, 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 to life. Not for just from a gameplay, but from an actual hard uh, science aspect to it. So. And I'd also just say in terms of a track record, you know, Vincenzo's got a great track record and this year he received Telefilm's Golden Reel Award. So that goes well into giving us confidence that he, he really understands what he's doing. And, you know, Jay's uh, no slouch himself. He's done a couple of things. <laughs> so. Well, actually, I just want to touch on something with you, Vincenzo, that Trevor brought up. And that was something that will be central to the game and the movie. And it's this idea of cyberspace. It's... Once Gibson put it out there, everybody is riffed on it. Obviously, Matrix, Johnny Mnemonic, tons of movies, science fiction, even the X-Files did their take on cyberspace. How did you come up with something fresh and innovative that was still faithful to the book? I can't tell you. Because <laughs> <laughs> no one can know. No one's allowed to know. Well, um, well then what were the factors in determining that? How did you approach it? I can, I can sort of tell you. I think, listen, there's two, there's two archetypes, um, as far as I'm concerned, for a depiction of cyberspace. One is the Matrix one, which is a virtual reality that essentially mimics our own. Um, and then the other is Tron, which is this kind of Euclidean type of cityscape where we're seeing very simplified graphic forms that more or less represent what our real world is. And... And my notion of what cyberspace is, without giving any sort of visual specifics, is that um, it is, of course, what it is in the real world. We have cyberspace. Um, and, uh, but, but my extrapolation on it is that cyberspace is the domain of the AI intelligences. And that is, and that is I think, the distinguishing feature in Neuromancer, um, certainly one of the things that sets it apart from the Matrix is, Matrix is it's very much about the birth of AI and how we are going to merge with it and vice versa and where it's leading us. And so um, it's this domain where you to project yourself into it as the cyber jockeys do in Neuromancer is not necessarily very friendly for human beings. It's not really, you know, we're as, as, as sort of wetware as as carbon-based life forms, we're really not designed, evolution isn't designed us to go into that kind of virtual environment. So it's a very rough ride and only certain people can do it. And it's a very trippy, uh, 
gray line between once you enter that space between what is generated in your own mind and your own consciousness and what actually exists as a kind of empirical uh, uh, cyber reality. And, and so, so I guess what I'm saying is that our version of cyberspace is a much more complicated, messy, and hopefully sophisticated depiction of what that world would be as opposed to Tron and Matrix, which again, I love, I say this with all due respect, but in, in my mind are a very simplified kind of Disneyified or comic bookified version of what that reality might be. And Trevor, anything to add? Because you, you did help develop. Well, we are, the, the, game, the interactive um, conceptualization of cyberspace is, is probably very different um, in the sense that it, parts of it will be experienced, right? Uh, rather than just visually represented. Um, and we've seen in games representations of cyberspace. We, we look at the Matrix uh, game as a, an example, right? It's, a, it's either this sort of alternate state or things like Tron, uh, or you know, simple sort of like representation of AI is like yeah, it's it's the you know MCP cone or whatever. Um, but what we're trying to do, uh, at least at this stage with the with the game, is um, maybe realize some of that kind of uh, communication. Cyberspace as a as a as a mode of of, uh, of communication or a place where uh, you can go and elicit sort of a certain result rather than a visual depiction. Which I know is sort of it sounds strange, but I think that for a game we've seen it so often. People playing games are already kind of in cyberspace, like they're at their PlayStation Three, <laughs> downloading whatever and doing whatever on their iPhones. Like it's it's really not a. Uh, I don't think it's going to be as as big a visual thing uh, as it is an experiential thing for the interactive. So Jay, I, do you think this this project sort of marks a shift in how everybody works together? I mean, this just seems very unusual that you have brought in so many people at different times that I'm used to in the development of a project? Well, I know a lot of uh, companies, uh, for commercial reasons, are realizing how much money they can make off the games. And everybody dreams of this. I tried to do a deal with Sony on Neuromancer. Uh, I mean, on um, Johnny Mnemonic. And I was negotiating this deal where they would be developing the game at the same time as the film. And they started spending money on it, and they were giving us some material to use for the film. And then all of a sudden, somebody said, oh, shit, by the time we get the game out, it'll be two years after the movie's made. Because the game development process is so much longer. So we just gave up, which was really sad. And then uh, I tried to make a deal with Comcast. Uh, I made a 10-game picture deal with them to try and do this again. Okay, where we were going to develop 10 concepts, pick the ones that would be games and films. And that failed because of the business plan of Comcast to do the games. Then I bought another one. I bought, um, what was the other one I bought? I can't remember the name. I bought a video game. I can't remember. It was a really big one, but I forget. It cost me a lot. But uh, uh, I can't That's remember the name. I did, I've, done this a, I've tried this a lot. Okay, I've been trying to do this a long time. The reason I did Lost Girl the other way, it's just easier. But uh, I bought one game. I spent a fair bit of money trying to put the film together on the game. And the game was going out in five months. And there was this $40 million ad campaign for the game. And, blah, 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 and I had to time the movie with the game. And I couldn't get the movie ready, and then the game came out because they were, I bought a maturely developed game, and then the game died, so I couldn't make the movie. So <laughs> I, I've been very frustrated with this process for quite a while, and uh, I decided this was a great way to go and see if I could get them all done at the same time. So uh, I think the game will probably still take longer than the movie if I do my job, and we'll have the movie. But the success of the movie will support the game. Well, there's like a $100 million budget for the game too, right? <laughs> Right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah. oh, and actually putting this thing together is, I don't know how many independent $60 million Canadian films get made. <laughs> uh, I don't think any right now. So it's a big task. So to get people to accept that there are other revenue streams from this, uh, Delray Brooks is already interested in the relaunch of the graphic novel, although they don't really know how that one failed yet, because I didn't tell them. But, uh, <laughs> and a few people have said, oh my gosh, you've got the game, you've got the book, uh, and the movie, and there's a whole campaign. Uh, we have somebody in the publishing arena who is dying to invest in this film. There's some reasons we might not be able to do it, but it's because they think of it as merchandising, game, uh, graphic novels, all these different things wrapped into one film. Uh, it's gonna be a hard deal. For, if I pull it off, I'll be really happy, but it's gonna be hard. 
Uh, so, you know, the, this is an attempt to do something. I failed at four or five times. That's all I really can say right now. <laughs> well, and interestingly, you, if you are successful, there are two more books. So, Vincenzo, is there any thought that you would do a second uh, Neuromancer film? Would you do Count Zero or would you do Mona Lisa Overdrive? Or do you see this as more of a one-off? Oh, no, it's not a one-off at all. I mean, you know, I think I don't... <laughs> Jay would actually almost be better to answer that question than me because I don't know where those rights sit and so on. I think it might be a little bit complicated. But, but fundamentally, what Neuromancer represents as a... And I hate this word, so just please nobody put this online because I don't even like using it. But uh, as a franchise is is really the paradigm that everyone is looking to find or to, you know find a property that matches that paradigm because um, movies are so expensive now and and in order to reach a vast audience and amortize all your costs making the film um, you you have to spread your media beyond the borders of a movie and, and in into other areas like games and graphic novels and so on and and because William Gibson's universe is so beautifully conceived and um, so complex and deep and there's so many regions of it that you could explore, I think that the hope I'm sure everyone on this panel has is that when this movie and the game are made, it's just the beginning of something rather than, you know, a one-off. Um, and, and I could envision it expanding in any number of ways. So, um, uh, and maybe that includes the, the sequelized books that Gibson wrote himself, maybe, maybe not, maybe something original that he does or that we do. By the way, I'm allowed to use the word franchise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I'm interested in this idea of maybe doing a book between the books or spinning off something. I mean, how, how kind of literal are you, are you guys getting? Are you, are you... Well, I, I've been asked by everybody who I've talked to to do a prequel. They all want a setup. And we've been talking about a way of sort of bringing, Neuromancer has a very mature audience right now, and bringing it to a younger audience could be done with a prequel. So there's been a lot of discussion about how to get it back out there in a very sort of widely dispersed way and appeal to 18-year-olds, not the Twilight crowd, but maybe, you know. But how would you do that? Like how, Vincenzo's already working on Neuromancer. How do you turn around and go, okay, we're gonna do a prequel? Would you do that at a different medium? Would that well, be a I, game? I'm, I actually, the publishers have all said to me that if I have the deal, we'll race to get a prequel out ahead of time. It's a race. Wow. <laughs> get that game ready, Trevor. <laughs> so but I was talking to somebody here out in there in coffee who said they could help me with this. I can't remember who it was now. <laughs> I said, we've got guys who can do this. And maybe Mark, one of the things, uh, you know, in terms of both Telefilm and the CMF, the, the coming together of the, you know, sort of the filmmaker and the, the digital industry is something, that's why this TIFF Nexus program is important. It needs to start happening. The moment someone has the aha moment is the moment you should be talking, you know, to, to someone that can build the digital side. It doesn't have to be the $100 million game that, that Trevor is, is, is built. 150, yeah, it sorry, it's just gone up now. No, <laughs> but... Uh, you know, there, there, we're living in this awesome tablet world. There are so many other vehicles. It doesn't have to be uh, a long game, a big game. It can be a small game. It could be a casual game. You know, a hobo with a shotgun did an awesome little game. There, there are ways that you can connect new audiences. I think that's the key, that this game will bring a new audience to the 18 year olds who have never read Neuromancer and they may go and pick up that book or watch that film. We have to start reaching audiences where they're at and they won't always come to the film first. I've had to say the same to the TV people a lot of the times. They'll find you because you've got some a uh, great website or a great gimmick, and then they'll come back in, like Lost Girl, right? Lost Girl found a whole audience because it's a great site. Uh, Lost I only Girl found an audience because really like of three 20-year-old girls who were Buffy fans, <laughs> <laughs> who I hired but when we first got the show ordered to go on the web and find every Buffy website and every Angel website and every Josh Whedon fan site and say, oh, there's this great show coming out, right? And it cost me very little money and we had a huge web presence before the show actually aired and Hollywood reported us as the, one of the top 10 downloaded pirated shows ever that year, which is 
good and bad. It has its <laughs> benefits. Uh, the big thing is We Beat True Blood is a pirated show. <laughs> we have fans all over the world before the show went. Uh, we went to Comic-Con. We're not on the air in the States. And we, were, we filled a room at Comic-Con with this huge fan base. And at... Um, Oh, shoot, I Fan, Fan Expo. Expo. Yep. Fan Expo, three-hour waiting list for autographs. Now, the show has phenomenal ratings here. It's, I can brag, right? now. okay. It's like the number one show on Showcase. It's doubled. It's number two show. It's huge. And if it wasn't for that web hype, I think that never would have happened. And we also, Trevor built us this interactive graphic novel that's at lostgirlseries.com. And it got gossiped about on all those websites. And it had tons of traffic before the show started. And now we're using that website for contests. We're going to have people make our own music video. And we're really merging all the media. And we did also a graphic novel, which was a limited graphic novel that we were handing out at these conferences. So it's, we've got everything. We've got the graphic novel. We've got the game. We've got the movie. I know I'm talking about another show. But it got Lost Girl, I believe, such hype before it actually got on the air that it would work. And one of the things the publishers talked to me about Neuromancer and what I said about the prequel graphic novel is if I can get it out there to that younger audience that doesn't know about Neuromancer, I've got a big sort of like pre-advertising uh, campaign. It's amazing how inexpensive it is to get things out on the internet and how valuable that is and you can spend $25 million on P&A on your average film and mm. not get the same benefit as you get from gossip about Blair Witch Project. And Trevor, you can track kind of the analytics of that too, yeah. right? Yeah, it's a much more controlled environment. And just uh, on the prequel point, just to sort of come back to that for a second, it, you know, we're not, uh, one of the things that, um, in talking with Vincenzo very early on, in the universe versus um, characters or, or normal story arc stuff, is we have the ability with interactive to do things like prequel. Like my point about the Knights of the Old Republic, it's not a Star Wars story, it's set in a Star Wars universe. So that's a very uh, easy way to shift your, um, uh, shift the perspective. And you can do things like prequels, there's lots of interesting characters in there, you can explore backstories are perfect for things like interactive. Like we did a game, Land of the Dead, on the Romero um, movie, and we explored the story of the guy who just hangs himself in the first four seconds of the movie, right? Like, what, what's that guy about, right? But it's very interesting, and fans of that really get into it because it's, it's an expansion of the universe rather than kind of a, of a directed experience. And on the large versus small game frontier, I firmly, firmly believe that we you know, need to uh, democratize uh, this kind of medium. Things like uh, mobile, things like social media, which is persistent, so the game doesn't come out because a normal game, like a PlayStation 3 game that's in a box, is kind of like a banana, and it's, v it's very difficult to time these correctly. Once they're out, there's a 90-day window of commercialization, and then it goes into, like, the used game bin, and that's done. So the idea that games are persistent experiences, that, they're be, you, that you're able to experience them on the bus as well as at home in front of your computer, as well as at work in front of your computer with a little minimized Facebook window, those are the, <laughs> those are the, new, that's the new gaming paradigm that works very well with this, uh, with this kind of uh, medium. So I, am I wrong? Is that the sort of the World of Warcraft online model? Is that what you're sort of thinking of? Well, yeah, World of Warcraft, you can access on your iPhone and do you know, platform-appropriate things there. And, and, and yeah, the persistence of it, you're telling stories in this, albeit that is a massive, that is a $100 million game. But, um, but, but that the persistence of it, that stories happen inside this universe and that consumers consume the content in the way they want uh, at their own pace and explore it at their own, on their own. Yeah, that, that is, I think, the new paradigm. I mean, I have a lot of friends that you know, are riding the TTC, and they'll just download before they get on, and then they've got, they don't care if the subway stops, because they're engaged, and they've got their mobile phone. So we have to, uh, as producers, start connecting with that, because the consumers want it. They want to be able to play on different platforms in different ways. You know, in terms of the console games, too, they're looking for that variety yeah. uh, in terms of how they play their games. So World of Warcraft has had a great expansion into a different market, you know, when numbers might not be w doing as great here. You find another niche, or you find new people that yeah. come back into that world. But Vincenzo, for you as a filmmaker, how does it feel to basically have your project out there in all these other different forms? Is that intimidating or does that piss you off or, or do you embrace it? <laughs> no, it's nice. 
Well, you know, it's very hard getting a movie made. And so when you have a great company like Bedlam and a great partner like Trevor involved, it, it really helps the cause of the movie. I mean, the reason we were able to do as beautiful and as elaborate um, design work at this very early stage is because of Bedlam, because they have great artists and, and they were able to, you know, put all of their attention to this project. If it were just Jay and myself, in order to finance some, something like that on our own, it would cost a lot of money. And, and it would be very hard to find artists of that caliber. So, so, so just from a pragmatic standpoint, it's great. And then from a creative standpoint, I think that it's a perfect marriage. I mean, I'm really interested in environmental kinds of movies. Like all of my films are very much, is probably as much to their own detriment, maybe as much about the environments as they are about the characters. And I, I like that idea of creating a world and being able to explore it. And so when you add a game platform to it, then you're just expanding the amount of exploration that can be done. And, and you know, you can go into like aspects of, um, a, 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 you know, a scene or a, a, a location in the movie that um, just due to the limitations of um, a two hour film, you can't really explore. But in the game, you know, you could, could in itself become a whole universe. So I, I no, I, I love it. And I, I mean, I like it in this way. I think where I would get pissed off as, as a filmmaker, co-creator, is if this were done purely after the fact to make a quick buck. And, and it somehow cheapened the movie. But because, because Jay has very cleverly made this an integrated process that starts Bedlam working on developing their game concurrent with the development of our film, to me it feels like a fully realized artistic endeavor. And I think will, you know, of course, uh, result in a, a much better product. So, uh, so no, no, I don't feel threatened by it at all. I think it's, it's great. And, sorry not to go on too long, but the other thing is when you're making films on this scale, and, you know, this will be a very large scale independent film, um, certainly, at the very least, then, um, and hopefully with a studio component to it, but uh, it's, it's just an enormous investment on everyone's part. And, and it's important to me that the investors recoup their investment. And, uh, and I, I think the only way to ensure something like that when you're dealing with this sort of scale is to be working in multimedia. Well, I'd like to do the humane thing now and just open it up to you, the audience. Um, you know, this is a Nexus panel, so it isn't just, you know, five people up here. Uh, so does anyone have a question or any, um, anything they'd like to add? Okay, sir. Okay, Mike, hello. <laughs> um, I've been waiting for this movie to come out for a long time, so I'm so excited about it. Um, and you said you had a few shots at it. Um, have you been in relationship with William the whole time? Like, had, were well, there competitors well, I, like wanting I said, I to put, grab it? I put um, Johnny Mnemonic together. Yeah. So I had a certain loyalty from him for making that movie, even because it did okay, you know, but it had a big cult following. He felt it was respectful, and uh, his films have been hard to make. <laughs> so we have a lot of support from Gibson himself. Uh, <laughs> I was, there's, another, there's a producer involved that I was giving money to on a regular basis, who to be honest, as delicately as I can say this, was controlling the creative for quite a while. And he'd say, hey, I want to use this guy, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to do this, and I was always supporting that. Uh, and then finally I just got <laughs> a little frustrated, I guess, because it had been quite a while, and I took it back. All right, uh, so yeah, I've got Gibson's support. I think Vincenzo did a lot to keep that for me because they're getting along so well. And I and Vincenzo's agent I'm friends with for 20 years sort of thing. So there's a business relationship there. Uh, and Vincenzo, uh, Gibson's offered me other properties if I want them. So he's like, believes this will get made and he believes that we're the right ones. And he actually is pretty excited by this whole process with the game, the graphic novel idea. He likes that we're just not thinking about the film. Ada Vaughn from Sable Films. Uh, all my projects, the target audience are mature audience. Do you have games developed for that kind of audience? And how, what's the difference in strategies in bringing them on board? And also I have a, 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 a request. May I have your contact info, Vincenzo? <laughs> because I have a project which has an environmental theme and the, 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 the game That's I want to tailor to it. 
Uh, is it possible? Or I can leave you I, mine. It's Sable Films, info at sablefilms.com. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, uh, I have a producing partner in, in Toronto named Steve Hoban and, uh, who works for Copperheart Entertainment. So if you look up Copperheart Entertainment, you can pass it on to him and it'll, it'll get to me. Okay. And well, maybe this is a question for Trevor. Uh, the, the audience and, uh, you know, the mature audience and games. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, the gaming audience actually now spans things from, I think typically people thought of it as sort of a 14-year-old male um, in the basement in the dark, you know, kind of audience, but it's not anymore. It's Gaming actually goes all the way up. I think the average age of a gamer now is, uh, I believe it's 31, um, and w which is sort of shocking to, to many people. And there are many people actually playing games, 55% uh, of people playing games are women, which is also another shocker, yeah. yeah. Uh, but but it's the it's the perception of what a game is, mm -hmm. right? Solitaire is actually a game, you know, it, or you know the way you engage with the game that you play in five minute bursts versus the eight hour, uh, you know, gaming festival in the basement sort of thing. So, uh, but is game that like Facebook games? I, I know that like women oh. of a certain age, like my, I, am I the mature audience? Or is it older? Am I the? Oh. <laughs> am I the Are we demographic driving of Ms. mature? Daisy, Daisy sort of. Oh God. <laughs> I'm a senior citizen. <laughs> so what I would say is that, it, that the games now do span, because of the different ways of engaging with them, uh, with mobile devices and PCs rather than just hardcore consoles, they actually span the whole gamut now from I think age four to, uh, I think they're tracking up to, to, to 67 in some studies that I've seen, yeah. When yeah. you look at casual games like Wii and Wii Fit, yeah. that blew the market open for that other kind of gaming. Absolutely. Um, but yeah. that's not really the Neuromancer kind of game that we're talking about in this context. No, 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 no. It's, it's, all, it's all platform appropriate, but, but I think that things like, uh, even like Rock Band, also revolutionize kind of what a game is. is are you playing music? What are you doing? And, that, and there's many people who answered surveys saying, I don't play games, but I play Rock Band. Or I don't play games, but I play World of Warcraft, which is <laughs> getting even weirder. But, but, but it's the perception of what a game is that has really kind of not allows us, allowed us to collect, collect good information. Collecting on farm animals on Farmville is a game, and a lot of people don't understand that they are playing a game. They yeah. just think they're collecting yeah. an animals. So, <laughs> <laughs> and and that's the demographic of like the 55 year olds and my aunts in California that send me requests to. Anyway, no, I don't want to buy a pig. So, so the casual game for this is going to be growing holographic roses. Is that? How no, that's I'm glad work? you. I'm glad you mentioned that. No, it will not be Cyber Farm. There will be no like. <laughs> you. <laughs> Telefilm will not be subjected to Cyber Farm. No. So is it, uh, let's go back because we've been doing so. Right at the very back there with your hand up. Yes, you. Well, yeah. That, a few the way. Queued up. Oh, there's sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. You already queued up. There's okay. Um, hope this question isn't too groan-inducing, but... Um, oh, no, no, you, he will ask because he has the mic. He is the conch at the moment, <laughs> and we'll get you a, a mic. Uh, just given the nature of the material and the nature of the team that's working on this and treating the technology uh, seriously and not treating it as an afterthought, I wondered if this was being conceived of as a stereoscopic production and if it was what kind of reception there was in the marketplace to that idea, either in terms of the game or the film. Well, we had discussions about 3D, <laughs> uh, which I actually, Vincenzo, you should take this because I think there was a lot of pressure on to consider 3D, but I'm not a jump up and down guy for that. I'm not a huge, well, <laughs> let me, um, I'll qualify this. Uh, <laughs> this is dangerous no only because market-wise 3D has a certain value that everybody likes and I don't know how that really applies to the film. You know what? It, listen, it's it, if as long as 3D movies make a lot of money, it's going to be a, a point of conversation, and and to some degree won't even be my choice. But um, but at the moment, I think the market's declining, and and I personally will make the argument. This is just my personal feeling about it that the technology just isn't there yet. I mean, I have I'm I'm all for 3D movies. I just don't personally feel like the glasses work that well and. Um, they don't enhance the experience for me. I think it's it's just not there yet. When I can walk into a movie theater and I don't have to, and I don't have to wear glasses, and it's the image is crystal clear and as vibrant and bright as a normal film projected image, then I'm 100% there for 3D. 
Um, the other consideration for us is that, so I'm not definitively saying anything one way or the other yet, but, but the other consideration for an independent film of this kind is that if we shoot it in 3D, we're basically virtually doubling our visual effects costs. So there's a dollar value associated with it, and, and you know, we would have to absorb that somehow into our, our budget, which I'm sure, I'll, I, I, I'm sure I'll be stretching to its limits. So, um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know, but I'm sorry, Trevor, you should probably pick it up from there. Well, you know, we're, we're at, as we've said, we're at the development stage, very early stages with the interactive exploration. So I wouldn't um, count anything out there. There are platforms that support it in a very natural way, like the 3DS and, you know, sorry, you know, which do it well for what it is. But I would say for things like stereoscopic for a big console, and we're not even sure that that's necessarily where this needs to reside, um, maybe digital. Um, the technology on the game side is fairly trivial. Like it's all, all major game engines currently can, uh, you know, render 3D. But to your point, do you want to, you know, be looking at the side of your TV screen and it kind of bleeds off? Whether that's a good game experience, we don't know. So I guess the short answer from the game side is it depends on the platform. It depends where um, the interactive journey takes us. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, on stage you're talking a lot about apps and games and uh, stuff like that, but there seem to be two separate languages that seem to be talked. One is there's you know, a film which you want to go out and sell, and it's based on a book, it's a linear narrative. And then you talk about things like adding a game, adding all sorts of other elements to this. So the question is about, at grassroots level, is this project um, and all the elements that you're talking about in terms of social media and the transmedia elements just a hype engine to raise awareness for the film? Or was there a story world actually considered when you read the book and said the film is one element of that rather than the central element? Well, I'll let Vincenzo answer that one or maybe Jay. But... <laughs> well, Trevor has the feeling that this game is going to do very well. So I have to say we wouldn't have gone this way if Trevor didn't see it see a commercial value to it. It was originally just twinkle in my eye sort of thing, and a lot of research. Uh, Delray Books, uh, the, you know, I'm friends with the editor-in-chief or whatever, and she said, Betsy said, well, I think this would be really cool. We could really do well. We'd do great with the book. Um, uh, again, one of the leading book websites, I won't say the name, has said we see huge potential to reissue Neuromancer and get it back out there if there's a film even announced. So there, everybody in every element of this has said they see a real commercial reason for it to be done. Uh, Trevor, you want to jump in the game? I know the movie, I think, is going to do great. And I know they all promote each other. So there is that definite hype value, promotional value that comes from doing it. But they are all separate profit centers as well. So, Yeah, I mean, just from the interactive perspective, I think that, that um, I would say that for, for us, it's really a sincere engagement with the subject matter. It'd be different if this was sort of like you know a toy story or something that wasn't a more natural fit. But I think that certainly in, in in working with Vincenzo, who's someone clearly passionate about the subject matter, and for us, and for actually anyone who loves sci-fi, this is something that has to be done or you know whatever. Um, so I wouldn't say the intention is is a is a is a hype machine. I think it's a uh, it's a sincere attempt to harness technology in an appropriate way now that we can. Um, you know, uh, not just sort of selling widgets or apps and stuff, but this is a story uh, or and a universe that is about things like cyberspace, uh, transhumanity versus humanity, all these sort of interesting sci-fi themes that we can actually do justice for in games now in a way that we couldn't before. I don't know if you played the, the early the uh, Neuromancer game. It's pretty <laughs> eight bits. Like, oh, I can feel the struggle between my transhumanity with this eight bit guy. Like no, and and not all properties. Uh, Bring you to that level, you know. I don't know if the whistleblower would lend itself to my dinner with Andre. <laughs> my dinner. With, you never know. You could do a restaurant <laughs> app, and anyway. So there are. I guess what I'm finding is it doesn't always have to be a literal connection in terms of transmedia. Sometimes there are elements that allow you to explore a whole other side. But this is where either you have the ability in yourself to, to do both at the same time or you partner with someone because in the end, both have to be developed independently. 
because they are completely different entities. You know, Jay's head and Vincenzo, you know, Vincenzo's a little split, but you know, Jay is, you know, get the, get the movie made and Trevor is focused on get the game made. So you have two different people and then Vincenzo will, will you know, gravitate between the two of them. But if you don't have people on the, you know, eyes on the different prize, I don't know if you're gonna be able to succeed because they are different processes with different uh, business plans and different approaches to business. And I think the hard thing is the tack on at the end to say, oh, we need a game. It, it doesn't uh, work. Or the other side to try and do it all yourself because it, it isn't easy. And, you know, to go to Trevor and he'll know all the funding. He'll tell you, you know, in terms of Ontario, what the funding is or be able to find the funding out. And, you, you know, if you're the filmmaker, you got a big challenge, you know, on your, on your own shoulders. So I think that's always my advice. And find, the paperwork is this much. And the paperwork yeah. is a lot. <laughs> So are we talking about Arrera Avis? Are we talking about something that could only really be done on Neuromancer because it is this property that allows you to do AIs and develop a, a fully kind of developed world? Case and Molly are a very small part of a much larger story that is only hinted at in those novels. So is, is this, in a way, unrepeatable? What do you think, Vincenzo? I'm sorry, is it what? Well, is Neuromancer really the only kind of umbrella for which all of this transmedia would work? Or do you see that this could work on many, many more projects than this? Um, well, I'm sure it's a question of how creative everyone is. But uh, I, there, I, re I recall that in The Simpsons there was a My Dinner with Andre game. And it looked pretty entertaining. I would have played it. But um, no, obviously Neuromancer lends itself to that. So that's, that's why this conversation is, is happening. But I'm sure that there are m many other properties, scripts, books, whatever, that, that would translate well into a, a game. And, um, and I even, you know, I wonder if game is, is a bit of a misleading word because as um, Francesca was saying, I think a lot of people play games and they don't even really consider them games. I mean, my, I'm not really interested, as far as my gameplay is concerned, is I'm not really interested in shooting things. Um, like with a gun. <laughs> I, I like exploring environments. And, um, you know, there is a game that uh, Electronic Arts put out recently called uh, L.A. Noir, And they recreated a whole section of Los Angeles as it was in the 1930s, I believe. And personally, I'd be much more interested in just strolling down those avenues, those virtual avenues, than I would be in the actual gameplay itself. So I think that end of the spectrum is a really open-ended one and you could do many different things <clears throat> with many different kinds of um, novels and adaptations and I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if um, at the end of the day people enjoy the Neuromancer game more than the movie. I mean I remember when Tron, the original Tron came out, the film was a, a complete financial disaster but the game was a massive hit and probably more people have a fond memory of playing the game than they do actually watching the movie. We have another question from the... Uh... Uh, thank you. Uh, the question really is to do with um, the acceptance of this type of multi-platform approach to development production and distribution. We've been pitching, my partners and I have been pitching this approach for about four years now. The funding agencies seem like dinosaurs. <laughs> in terms of understanding how that works and why it would work. And of course, much more easy to understand with your high concept uh, um, project. But as you were mentioning, it can be applicable in many circumstances. And, and we've gone after that many, many, many times. And yet there seems to be this real resistance. And there's a total um, lack of understanding about how that gets done, even when we bring the experts into the picture. And then uh, on top of the agencies, the distribution channel doesn't seem to be ready for it either. They're uneducated about it, not entirely. There are people, obviously some people that do, but they don't really see it as part of their, their strategy. They're not really looking at it as a large revenue stream yet. The possibility, like they're not really gearing themselves up for it, just really, you know, really, really low numbers as we've been asking people over the course of the panels this week. So I'd like to know how you sort of leapfrog that, other than the fact that, of course, there's a natural 
uh, fit and people can see that more readily with your project. But how you leap from Well, there's a natural fit just, and people can see that. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, but, but more than that, the, even with that. Unfortunately, that's the easy answer. Yeah, uh, even with that. I mean, okay. it's very hard to pitch on other things. I, I think that uh, the, what I learned from my little experience with Trevor when we, hey, what's it called again, the green jade thing? <laughs> the century jade. Se century jade, sorry. Vincenzo, can you send me your email? Because I want you to do century jade. jade yeah. <laughs> no, but what I, what I learned when Trevor and I first sat down on his game, he was developing century jade, and he said to me, let's do a movie together out of the same thing, is I learned that in order to get levels and places that kids could achieve certain things, that he was more concerned of the journey they did. I was more concerned for a film to work of relationships. And we sat down for a couple hours, and all of a sudden, Trevor says, oh, this can work, you know? I can do the game, you can do the movie. And we worked very hard to find a project that sort of could go all those levels. We ended up, and we're gonna develop this, creating something brand new, totally original, that. A game company could be excited by it. A film company could, I got a writer who says, this is cool, this is super great. The guy wrote big action adventure movies and he's excited. Trevor knows how to sell the game. The graphic novel's the easy part. But it was an original idea, well, Trevor's, but I changed it. And uh, now it goes across all the platforms. And I think Trevor and I are trying to find a number of things to do that way. Uh, again, sorry, I keep, I don't know if the funding the is there yet. I mean, in terms of the Canada Media Fund, it was uh, kind of new and people are still learning. I mean, even in development, we're kind of forcing there to be an interactive side and people are scratching their heads to kind of figure out, well, what do I do? And uh, I think we're catching up. On the feature film side, we're catching up at a sort of different level with, you know, Web Cine 360, where it's more in the marketing, social media side of it. I think it will happen, but it, it all, all of us get a lot of our money from Heritage, and Heritage is catching up. You know, we're actually quite, and get this on film, we're quite lucky to have James Moore because he is actually quite connected and understands that relationship. And I don't think if, if we had someone else, because we've had many who have tried to change the funding system, I don't know if we would have been able to have this opportunity. We certainly wouldn't have had an experimental stream uh, at all that would allow for this exploration. I, I can only say keep trying, but you may have to hive off, and, and I'm sure you're quite creative if you've been producing, that you know, you, you're gonna have to kind of go feature film one way and uh, I see a nice people person from the OMDC. You know, there are other funding agencies if you fit their requirements. <laughs> One thing I would say too, though, is it also requires a certain sort of uh, open-mindedness to the to the process. It hasn't necessarily been traditional because the sides haven't talked very well. Uh, Vincenzo is a very good. Uh, Jay is an excellent ambassador for this because he's he's tried it and his mind is open to these things. Vincenzo is also very good to work with this way as well because it's not one medium yelling at the other medium saying, look, this is, this is my thing and then this thing has to be a derivative work of this and you will do my bidding and it's not, uh, and, and that is kind of being that way. Um, either a game company saying, my game is so awesome, you should make a movie and I'll direct it. No, it's terrible, right? So I, I think it does require to go to things like the OMDC funds, are, they are available, but it requires a production company to surrender the reins. And it's like, look, I'm not gonna be able to drive this process. I had to find a partner I trust, and there has to be a, the requisite sort of IP assignments, and, and, and that level of trust has to be high to then allow the digital um, uh, creator to, to, to go and access these things, which is typically the disconnect, is the, I have to get my arms around the whole thing, and that's, kind of where it, it's failed both ways, in, in my view. There's a person here in the second row that has been waiting patiently to ask yes. a question. It may be irrelevant, but what I'm saying, I want to ask, this is sort of the future kind of thing, in two, maybe five years, that film, like going to the cinema, taking on a film, will be passe, and they were really interactive, will take over as in, um, with the apps, with uh, games, with everything else, and it's just, you know, pushed by financial uh, situation, of course, but I just wonder about that. And also seniors are not that out of it. We, we do keep up sometimes. Thank you very much. I just had to qualify that in her world I was a senior. So uh, I, honestly, I think, you know, I, I don't represent any of the, you know, the, the movie houses, the cinemas, but they are working hard 
to keep viewers engaged. I mean, 3D is a fortunate or unfortunate uh, way to, to you know, keep viewers going there, but they are trying to make it an experience because honestly, there is nothing like seeing a, you know, a feature film blown up with the surround sound that goes on now. It is an experience that you know, is important to a lot of films. Something like this, starting on a tablet, is not the way you want to necessarily experience it for the first time. Well, I also go back to Marshall McLuhan. I mean, one medium doesn't replace another. So we still have radio, even though we have all kinds of other social media. Sorry, Trevor? Yeah, no, and, and, I, and I think that's very true. It's, the, the, I don't think interactive um, will, uh, you know, take over film, because film, to me, is an inherently social experience. It's about going to this place and being in a room with other bodies that you hear other people laugh or groan or whatever it is that are reacting to the same, the medium is passive but the audience is a little more active, whereas in a game, it's a very different experience. So it's, I, I don't see interactive as the death of film. I see them as separate and, and in many ways complementary. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So two more questions, and I don't know who's the person who's got the, the wand of power. Hi, uh, my name is Sintel, I'm, I'm a filmmaker. And uh, I was talking to somebody else and they were saying, uh, that there is a new position to manage all this kind of like a producer, media development, or like who manages these social aspects, apps aspects, and, and here the game aspects. I want to know if you had anything specialist who, are, who, are, who played this bridge role or this integration role in your project, or you do see a requirement moving forward for that sort of a role? That's my first question. Second is it for the director? We have four it? degrees in all the different disciplines. I mean, actually, quite honestly, I'm scared of any one person doing this because there are conflicts. And uh, that's the one thing I think we learned is I had to give Trevor a fair bit of freedom to get what he needed to be done. And if you ask me how the hell he's doing it, I haven't got a clue. Uh, we have an interactive game. I don't know what he did. I mean, I sat in the room and I know the creative, you know, I know the designs, I know what we're trying to accomplish, the objectives, but how you actually pull it off. And what made it commercial, I'm starting to learn just now. But uh, I don't know if you could combine all these. In but one there position. is, I guess, in Hollywood, they've now created this new position where, I, what is it called, the director of... BMD, I heard it's BMD yeah. or something. Like so that. there is uh, this new position that's apparently hired on right from the beginning to ensure that they're, you know, from the moment the cast is created, they're, I mean, it has more to do with social media because they get the cast tweeting almost right away. They do soft Facebook launches and they create this, you know, Hunger Games is doing it big right now and doing all those little soft marketing. But that's but more for marketing. marketing. That's it for, is, oh, it's sorry, a totally was you just saying for marketing? It's a marketing position that marketing works position in between, for sure there is. but it, it works in between your interactive side and the production side, correct? But I don't know that they're merging development. I mean, I actually had lunch with the guy who did this for Apple, uh, and he laughed because it wasn't a successful thing for them. And they're still trying and trying and trying to do something. But it's a tough thing to get all the medium under one person who can understand them all. Uh, well, it's I think more, it might be an administrative job where you pull in all the expertise and make sure it happens, but I don't know if you can rely on one person to understand three or four dis disciplines. Uh, but then the follow-up question for the director is, uh, was it too much? I, I know director already has so much on the plate. I mean, as a, as a personal role as a director, I mean, how much is it overhead for a director to, you know, being part of this project and, and uh, extending his, uh, his energies into this, uh, into this uh, uh, new process? Yeah. Well, <coughs> actually, <laughs> I'm not really doing that much. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's sort of a machine that runs itself, or rather, I should say, it's, it's Bedlam that's doing the game work. And then, in a sense, we're just inspiring each other. There, there's a very, at least at this stage, I mean, believe me, I, I don't even know what I'm talking about because I've never done this before. I'm just learning as I go. But, it, but my sense is that there's a synergy between the two entities, the film entity and the game entity, and um, especially working at this stage when we are actually quite, in a very real way, collaborating because I'm using their artists to create designs that are to inspire my movie, but will also work to inspire and sell their game. And, uh, and so um, it's been no extra work for me. And, and I, don't, I would never dream of writing the game. I don't think I'm, I would do a very good job. I don't think I'm qualified, but I'm, 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 I hope I can be a, a helpful consultant in the creation of the game. So it's, it's not an energy drain for me at all. And the only other thing I'll say quickly is that when you make a movie, 
especially this kind where you're where you're creating a world, you invariably design outside the edges of of the screen, beyond the edges of the screen. Like there's a lot of a lot of designed movies of this nature that never actually is, sees the light of day. It's never actually seen in the movie, or if it is, it's glimpsed at briefly in the background. But that little object, whatever it is, that is that is designed in the background actually requires a lot of time to design. And so it's very exciting for me to see that that effort that would go into the movie, regardless of whether there was a game or not, might actually find more, might be given more attention and more life in the in the game world. And and that isn't any additional effort on my part. Um, so uh, that that's been the experience so far. So one final question: Do we have a no, or are we? I'd like to very much thank all of our panellists here, um, Vincenzo, Trevor, Francesca, uh, Jay and Mark. This is a really fantastic panel. Um, <laughs>